All right, so good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get uh, started pretty promptly um, because we want to maximize the time for our speakers today. Um, so thank you, for everyone, for joining us uh, for our June Lunchtime Expedition speaker presentation. Um, my name is Corey Anko. I am the interim curator here at the Draper Natural History Museum. Um, so first thing is always, if you would, please silence or turn off your mobile electronic devices. Um, please and thank you. We want to take a minute to thank our sponsors, Sage Creek Ranch and the Nancy Carroll Draper Charitable Foundation for helping to make all of our programming possible and for bringing that to you. And we also want to thank you, our in-person as well as our virtual audience, um, for tuning in each month for the Lunchtime Expedition speakers. Um, if you have suggestions for speakers, please feel free to email me. My email is usually always included on the last slide um, at the end. Um, and then these lectures are being recorded. So if you'd like to catch a previous lecture, uh, again, just so you can email me or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, and then if you're not on our listserv, um, flag me down, we'll get you added there. We send out announcements about once a month for upcoming presentations. And included in that announcement are the links to previous presentations so you can access them there. Um, today, uh, we are joined by two incredible and accomplished scientists. Uh, Dr. Ray Wells received his Bachelor's of Science in Geological Science from Penn State, his Master's of Science from the University of Oregon, and his PhD from the University of California, Santa Cruz. He has been investigating the geologic evolution and seismic hazards of the Cascadia subduction zone in the northwestern United States for the U.S. Geological Survey since 1975. He is a recipient of the Distinguished, Science, Distinguished Service Award of the Department of the Interior and was the 2017 recipient of the Geological Society of America's Geologic Mapping Award in honor of Florence Bascom. Dr. Vic Camp received his Bachelor's of Science in Geological Sciences from Marshall University, his Master's of Science from Miami University, and his PhD from Washington State University. He spent 10 years in Africa, Iran, and Saudi Arabia before obtaining a teaching and research position at San Diego State University in 1988. His research is well published in the international literature with more than 4,500 citations. His current research focus is on the geologic evolution of volcanic terrains in the Pacific Northwest with a specific interest in, on volcanism related to the early history of the Yellowstone hotspot, the feature of today's topic. He was inducted as a fellow of the Geological Society of America in 2021. Please give Dr. Ray Wells and Vic Camp a very warm welcome. Yeah, here's one. Hi, everybody. Everybody hear me okay? This one. Yep. Nope. This should, should be on. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Not loud enough. Can you hear me now? Is that better? No. Still can't hear me. I'll use the handheld. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Testing one. Technical difficulties. <laughs> Thank you, Corey. Okay, I, I was going to uh, say something about this introductory slide here. It's not just the title slide, it's actually a nice picture, so I thought people might be interested in this. It's that Steens Mountain uh, in eastern Oregon, and it's looking down uh, over the escarpment of Steens Mountain into the Alvord uh, Desert. And what you're looking at here is a series of lava flows, and these lava flows go back about 16 million years old. And for a long period of time, uh, we thought that these lava flows were, in fact, the very first expression of the Yellowstone hotspot. Yet they're a long ways away from Yellowstone, so the question is why. Uh, the very thin flows, um, but other than being a pretty picture, 
Uh, you can also see the dikes that feed these flows, these vertical features you know, coming up here. So these would rise up to the surface as liquid lava and then erupt on, on the surface as what we call fissure eruptions. So um, let's get started here uh, with the actual story. Um, to put this in, in perspective, I mean, we all know where Yellowstone is. We're almost sitting on top of it uh, right now. You can see Cody uh, on, the, on the map, uh, uh, the Yellowstone caldera, which is a large depression uh, shown here, which is a reflection of the Yellowstone hotspot today. We know the Yellowstone hotspot, of course, is um, uh, well known you know, for producing three large super eruptions over the last two uh, uh, million years. But it also has an incredible um, history that's much longer than that. Uh, so to put this in, in perspective, uh, the first thing I want to do is I, I want to, Ray and I both want to do this, and we're going to do it in segments, sort of, sort of back and forth. We're going to uh, first talk about, you know, or ask the question, what actually is the hotspot? You know, people use the hotspot, you know, as, as the terminology, but what actually is it? But we also want to uh, think about how old is, is the hotspot. It turns out it's very old. You know, it goes back a, a long period of time, and that's going to be a, a large part of our, um, of our discussion. We also want to put this in a more regional perspective in terms of the west, uh, western U.S., or more specifically the northwestern U.S. Uh, things we'll talk about, for instance, are the eastern Snake River Plain, just to the west of um, the Yellowstone uh, hotspot today, or the large Columbia uh, River flood basalt province that you see here. Uh, this is a massive amount of lava flows that covers a significant portion of the Pacific Northwest. What you see in red uh, represents the active volcanoes, whoops, the active volcanoes of uh, the Cascade Volcanic Arc. Um, you know, so this is a long-lived area of um, uh, volcanic activity. And then on the coast, we see the coast range. Geologically, uh, the coast range is composed of um, marine sediments that overlie and partly cover uh, a whole thick sequence of um, uh, submarine uh, basalts. Um, and, um, you know, this is a, a particular, um, uh, particularly important with regard to our, our discussion. Uh, and Ray will touch on this uh, discussion. Those basalts are, uh, you know, 50 million years old or a little bit older than that, in, in, in fact. Okay, so, so there are a number of things, you know, just to set the, um, the stage, you know, we want to begin at the, the, the park itself. And, you know, people are familiar with the Yellowstone caldera, and you can see it over here in the red outline on, on the left-hand side. But what's actually under that? So what you're looking at uh, is a cross-section uh, that goes across the caldera up here. And you can see the depth that goes all the way down to about 90 kilometers depth. That's about 55 miles if you're not used to the metric system. And what we have uh, is uh, a sequence where we can subdivide uh, units in here, or features, I should say, uh, that separate the Earth's crust, we see here, the lower crust from the upper crust, and the mantle of the Earth, at least the very upper portion of, of the mantle of the Earth. Within the mantle, we have something we call a mantle plume, uh, which is a large conduit of really hot rock, and uh, that melts periodically. And when it melts, it produces a magma, and that magma has a basaltic composition, and it ponds in the lower crust here to produce a large reservoir, if you will, or magma chamber of basalt rock. But that basalt is so hot that it has the capability of melting the lower crust. And when it melts the lower crust, it produces another kind of magma called rhyolite. And that rhyolite then rises up into another reservoir, a rhyolite magma chamber. And this rhyolite is what produces the actual Yellowstone caldera. And we have super eruptions from the hot spot that's associated with this uh, uh, large mass here of, uh, of rhyolite magma. So to just think about that, you know, if people don't know what basalt is and what rhyolite is. I mean, that's understandable, but I, I put some pictures up here. You know, if you take a basalt and you cool it into a rock, this is what it looks like, very dark color. It's uh, enriched in iron and magnesium for, for the most part. But if you look at rhyolite, you know, if you cool a rhyolite magma and harden it into a rock, it looks like this. It's much lighter, and that's because it's higher in silica, if you will. But the important point is that when basalt erupts and rhyolite erupts, it erupts in a different fashion. You know, basalt, when it erupts on the surface of the earth, it's a very calm, quiescent, gentle eruption, just kind of the oozing out of basalt, you know, on the surface of the earth. But when rhyolite erupts, it's often highly explosive. You know, when you produce the largest explosive uh, volcanic eruptions on Earth, they're almost always associated with a high silica rhyolitic type of, uh, 
of magma. So when you hear about super eruptions uh, from uh, Yellowstone or associated with the Yellowstone hotspot, they're associated with the rhyolite. Uh, but also keep in mind that the hotspot can generate massive amounts of basalt you know, at, at, at the same time. So that, those are two important things uh, uh, to realize. Now, the other thing I want to do is I want to concentrate here on this other feature, the so-called mantle plume, because this has been very controversial in geology for a number of decades. You know, this is what many of us feel the hot spot is. It's a plume. And the very definition of a plume or a mantle plume is a column of magma that actually has its source well down within the inter Earth's interior at the core mantle boundary. And it rises up as hot rock because it has lower density. And as it rises, it impinges uh, on, the, on the, uh, the tectonic plate, and that's where melting actually begins. So here you can see it, it impinges. Everything above that mantle plume is a tectonic plate, uh, and when it melts, it produces uh, the magmas that, that we just discussed. But that controversy has been around for a long period, and the reason is because people, geophysicists, we'll say, geologists that have a, a strong uh, uh, background in physics, uh, have not been able to actually detect a true mantle plume underneath uh, Yellowstone. Uh, there is a way to do this, we believe, a uh, process called seismic tomography. It's kind of like a CAT scan for your body. You know, if you want to know what's happening inside your body, you go get a CAT, CAT scan. Um, well, there's a similar se seismic tomography that we use for the Earth to look at the interior of the Earth, but we use uh, uh, earthquake waves in order to determine, kind of similar to a CAT scan. But we haven't been able to recognize this until uh, fairly recently, 2018, where we have been able to see, uh, through seismic tomography, a large conduit of uh, low-density magma, a mantle plume, if you will, that rises from the core mantle boundary all the way up to Yellowstone. Uh, so today, I mean, that's where we are. You know, we're right there. Underneath your feet is this, this column that descends uh, throughout much of the Earth itself. Uh, so I think th that the, Im the image you're looking at has convinced many people, even a lot of geophysicists, that mantle plumes uh, do exist, and in fact, there is one underneath uh, uh, Yellowstone itself. So just a little bit more about a mantle plume that uh, I, I want to touch on. You know, mantle plumes, uh, at least the concept is that we can subdivide this large mass of material into two parts, a large bulbous head that you see right here, and a, a thin uh, tail that's constantly feeding material into the plume. And as that material rises up with its big head and it, it hits the bottom of the lithospheric plate, or tectonic plate, I should say, right through here. It then spreads out into a large mushroom uh, shape. And the center is the hottest portion of the mantle plume. And that's where you get the greatest amount of volcanic activity, right above the center. Uh, but this huge head, uh, when it begins to melt, it produces massive amounts of basalt. And on a continent, we refer to that as a continental flood basalt province. But if it happens to be underneath the ocean, we would refer to that as a large oceanic plateau. So both those are massive amounts of basalt lava generated above the plume. But plumes can also generate a hotspot track. Uh, this is a, a much linear, localized area of volcanic activity. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it is produced by the mantle plume tail. You know, it's much thinner. The idea is, you know, that large head, once it spreads out, eventually it'll dissipate and be removed, and then you'll have the tail that will then produce a hot spot track. And that hot spot track actually produces a, a progressive sequence of um, volcanic activity as a stationary plume or largely stationary plume moves over it, you know, over time. I'll show an example of this so you'll, you'll be able to understand that a little, little bit better. Um, just as an example of a flood basalt, if you go to India, there's the Deccan flood basalts. It's one of the larger ones on Earth. Uh, massive sequence. Everything you see here is a, a sequence of lava flows, you know, well over, you know, a kilometer in thickness. And it covers about, you know, a quarter of the entire country, you know, of India. Uh, they're fairly, rail, uh, fairly unusual in the geologic record, you know, but if you find one somewhere, you know, it's going to be a, 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 a massive amount of eruption. On the other hand, a good example of a hotspot track is, uh, is at Hawaii. Uh, if you think of the common uh, six, uh, six major islands in Hawaii, you can see it right here. The arrow represents the direction of, of plate motion of the, of, the, of the Pacific plate. And here you can see the plate in cross section, and it's moving over uh, what could be a stationary plume. Now, in concept, we believe the plume is stationary. In reality, it may not be. You know, there's still some controversy over that. It might, it might actually waver a little bit over, uh, over time. But if you assume it, it's, uh, it's stationary as the plate moves over it, whoops, let me go back here. 
If you assume that's true, if you go to Hawaii today, where we have volcanic activity occurring is on the big island of Hawaii. But if you go to the southwest portion of the island, it's not active. And that's because it's moved off the mantle plume a little bit. And then if you move a little bit farther away, you have Maui right here. And the age of the volcanic rocks, the basalt's about 1.3 million years. At Molokai, it's 1.8. At Oahu, 3.5. At Kauai, it's about 5 million years. So you have a progressive sequence of older and older islands as you go farther away from the mantle plume, all a product of the stationary plume moving, mat moving material away uh, from the original source of volcanic activity. Well, now let's just use that concept and think about what we have here. Oops, I think we're missing a slide, but that's okay. Uh, think about what we have here in terms of um, uh, Yellowstone. Uh, at Yellowstone National Park, you know, we're all familiar with the caldera uh, dominated by this explosive, you know, uh, super eruptions of rhyolite. But if you go farther to the southeast into the eastern Snake River Plain, there's a whole series of rhyolite uh, calderas and, and uh, rhyolite complexes or caldera complexes, all resulting from super eruptions in the geologic past. They get progressively older from Yellowstone all the way down here to the McDermott caldera. Uh, right along the Nevada-Oregon uh, 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 border. And um, if you then look up to the north, we have the youngest flood basalt eruption on Earth. This is the Columbia River uh, uh, flood basalts. And uh, the oldest lavas, uh, as you see, you know, these features here represent dikes or, you know, the hardened rocks that I talked about before at Steens Mountain, right through there. And the lavas in the first image that I showed represent uh, the oldest lavas of the Columbia River basalt at 17 million years old. The ages of the rhyolites here are very, you know, almost contemporaneous, almost exactly, about 16 and a half uh, million years old. So what that means is where we have the hotspot track and where we have the flood basalt province, uh, we have a coincident here that's, uh, 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 that's equal in terms of time, but also equal in terms of space. You know, the same geography at the same age. The idea here is that the flood basalts were produced by the plume head, thinking of the concept, and then the hotspot track was produced uh, above the tail. Now, why would this happen? Well, there is one other feature here that I want to talk about. You can see something here called the cratonic boundary. I'm not going to go into the detail of what this actually is, but what it represents is an older and thicker portion on the eastern side of the tectonic plate, of the North American uh, plate, if you will. And if you go to the western side of that boundary, we have a thinner and younger portion of uh, the North American plate. The idea here is when the plume head came up, came up it was focused here against the, the cratonic boundary. And as the plate moved, moved in this direction, it sheared off the plume head, and that then allowed the plume tail to start producing an age-progressive uh, hotspot track all the way up to its current position today at, uh, at, at Yellowstone, Nation, uh, Yellowstone National Park. So that kind of fits the model, you know, the hypothetical model. And most of us were very convinced, in fact, that this is, you know, nicely explains, you know, the initiation, arrival of the Elston hotspot 17 million years ago, and its continuation as the plate moved over it to where we have Yellowstone today. But there are some questions here, and one of the questions is, does the Columbia River Basalt truly represent the arrival age of the, of, uh, of the hotspot? Or could it be even older? Well, one of the problems is that we have, we have not found any indication of a continuation of the hotspot track. Uh, so most of us would say no. Uh, but in fact, uh, we're going to give uh, data here that's going to suggest that it is, in fact, quite old. Uh, it may go back to about 56 million years. Uh, it may be at Yellowstone today, but 56 million years ago, we believe, in fact, it was offshore. And Ray's going to talk about this right now. didn't work for you, but does, is this one working for you guys? Can you hear me okay? Good? All right. That way I can wave my arms. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so the real issue here is, yeah, what, what happened at that question mark? What happened uh, before 17 million years ago? And, um, that, and how old 
could the Yellowstone hotspot be? Well, other hotspots, turns out, are pretty old. For example, the, the hotspot that uh, Vic just mentioned at Hawaii, he just showed you this little five million year old part, but it, you can trace it back all the way to practically Kamchatka, where it's diving underneath uh, Asia, where it's almost 76 million years old here. 55 million, 50 million, and so on. So this hotspot's been around for a long time. And uh, I use the term MA, 76 MA. That's just short for mega annum, which is millions of years. So when I'm saying the Hawaiian emperor chain is 76 MA, it's 76 million years old. In Iceland, the Icelandic hotspot, which underlies Iceland, there are old rocks along the east side of Greenland that are almost 60 million years old. So the Iceland hotspot has been around for a long time. So what are the implications of that for Yellowstone? Well, it's really interesting that basaltic rock that uh, Vic mentioned, the oceanic plateaus and such, which are generated by hotspots underneath the ocean floor. Um, there are two places in North America. Here, North America is lying on its side. This is Alaska. This is Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana, and there we are. Right there, Cody. I should have written it in, Cody. <laughs> so, uh, so on the coast of uh, Oregon and Washington, is a suspect basalt terrain that has basalts that look like they were erupted in the ocean uh, on the ocean plate. And up at Yakutat, we have the same thing in Alaska, very thick pile of basalt that looks like uh, it was erupted uh, in an oceanic environment. Over here in uh, Oregon and Washington, these red uh, polygons here represent exposures of uh, oceanic basalt, uh, which we call the Siletz terrain or Siletzia, and it's named for the Siletz River volcanics, which are exposed in Oregon along the Siletz River. And there are similar rocks in Washington called the Crescent Formation, and also in southern British Columbia on Vancouver Island called the Machosan Igneous Complex. Uh, this represents a very large basaltic terrain. It's almost uh, 30 kilometers thick, uh, and it represents a whole lot of basalt. And the two of them together have very similar geologic histories and suggest they might be related in some way. Now, when you go to the Oregon coast, it's a lot different than here. When I flew into Cody, I'm looking out the window. I took a picture and I texted my wife, Sally. I said, here the geology sticks out like the bones of a carcass. I mean, you can, it's very clear what's going on. Here in the coast range of Oregon, you know, with 100 inches of rain on the west side, uh, you have to uh, look for the rocks in the bottoms of the rivers and along logging roads uh, where many of the big Douglas fir are being harvested. And what you see is this kind of basalt. It has this radial round sort of pillow-like structure. And uh, here's an entire pile of it. This is what the Siletz River volcanics look like. Uh, and it's called pillow basalt and it was erupted underwater. Here's a uh, video from Hawaii of pillow basalt actually being created. It forms a skin right away as a result of the cooling effect of the water. And it kind of grows like yeast, you know, budding uh, and creates these spaghetti-like tubes uh, underwater and makes huge piles uh, of basalt. When you look at the broader uh, picture of uh, Siletzia, those pillow basalts usually form the bottom of the pile and uh, they are overlain by breccias of different kind from, uh, from basalts that are broken up by sliding downhill or by explosive activity near the shoreline. And then ultimately, when you build up the pile high enough so that it meets sea level, you get subaerial lava flows, which are columnar jointed and usually have reddish contacts where they're oxidized uh, between the flows. And this sequence that we see uh, in Siletzia um, uh, represents what we think uh, 
an oceanic island looks like with pillow basalts at the bottom, uh, slopes made of basaltic breccia units, and then subaerial flows at the top. And so here's Hawaii from a few years ago. Uh, maybe this is what Celestia looked like 50 million years ago. So how did that basalt terrain uh, become attached to the continent? Well, one possibility, of course, is that uh, it's an ocean island chain like Hawaii. And it was offshore here of Western North America 55 million years or so ago. It was be created potentially at something like the Yellowstone hotspot. And then it arrived and docked uh, against the continental margin. Another possibility, of course, is there was some mid-ocean spreading ridge offshore creating basalt and some interaction between a hotspot and the spreading ridge created rifting along the margin of the continent, tore a piece off and sent it northward toward Alaska and left a piece here in Oregon, Washington. So what's the role of Yellowstone in a situation like this? Well, uh, if these are the sort of oceanic islands that have been accreted to the continent here in Silesia, uh, Bob Duncan, back in 1982, who's at Oregon State University and a hotspot uh, specialist, uh, argued that these basalts were formed at the Yellowstone hotspot. Well, they certainly don't lie on the trend of the Yellowstone hotspot track, which would be down here. North America has been moving southwest over time, and that's where the track should be. And here it is, way up in the Pacific Northwest, and this track that Bob suggested looks pretty funny. Why is it crooked? Well, one, he could be wrong. <laughs> but another possibility is that the track has moved. And here in, on the right, we see the Pacific Northwest, Washington, Oregon, California, Nevada, Cody, uh, Idaho, Utah. And what this shows, these arrows, show the direction of motion of the plates from, of the North American plate from GPS velocities. So the GPS thing that's in your car that shows you where you're going, if you take that and put it on a concrete pier and then watch it for years on end, slowly you will see the motion of Western North America as a result uh, of the motion of that GPS uh, station uh, that's attached to the continent. And the amazing thing about the Pacific Northwest is that it's rotating in a clockwise circle at uh, millimeters per year. That's 10 millimeters per year. So these are like three to five millimeters. Here's Yellowstone. It's moving away from Yellowstone and then going north along the shore and back like that. We think that clockwise rotation is the result. Here's the Pacific plate down here. There's the Mendocino fracture zone and the triple junction. This little sliver is Pacific. And that arrow shows the direction in which the Pacific plate is moving with respect to North America. It's moving really fast to the north at a couple inches a year. And this is rotating like a ball bearing uh, as Pacific plate is uh, dragging the western edge of North America northward. And we think maybe that could help us explain uh, why uh, the hotspot track in the Pacific Northwest doesn't exactly line up with the way we think it should. So let's look at Celestia and see what it's made out of. Well, I've done a lot of mapping in the Oregon and Washington coast ranges over the years. And I've looked at uh, these pink things are Celestia. Uh, exposures. Uh, we've done a lot of radiometric dating, magnetic polarity, global fossil zonation to allow us to hook up the story of Celestia to a global time scale. Uh, and what we see when we look at the ages of Celestia, we have a couple of different kinds of radiometric ages from uh, argon argon and from uranium lead. And they all run between 49 to 52 million years in the north of the Oregon Coast Range to about 53 and 56 million years in the southern part of the Oregon Coast Range. And the fossil coccolith zones match perfectly with these ages, so we feel pretty confident about the ages. So let's look at this spot right here. Here's a spot 
where the Silesia basalts are juxtaposed against the older rocks of the Klamath Mountains. So we'll zoom in there. When we go down here to Roseburg, Oregon, at the southern end of the Coast Range, there's a big fault right here, and that big fault bounds uh, an anticline, an uplift of Silesia, which is thrust underneath rocks that are 60 to 100 million years older. And this boundary right here is this boundary right there. And a cross section through this area shows that the Silesia is folded and thrusted as a result of the collision of that island, uh, of that oceanic basalt terrain with the continent. And that collision happened before all these folds from the collision go underneath that unconformity right there. And this strata, which is 49 million years old, is not folded like that. So the collision happened about 50 million years ago. This is what we think it might have looked like. So what I did was take the Hawaiian Islands uh, a bathymetric map from the University of Hawaii and stuck it on Google Earth. <laughs> And, and in fact, as if it had collided with North America along the old subduction zone and got stuck here. And when it got stuck, a new subduction zone started up outboard uh, to produce the present day Cascade Arc volcanics. Um, what happened after collision? Well, it's interesting. These blue polygons, which, I sh which we saw before on the previous map, Renewed volcanism happened after Silesia crashed into the margin. And these subaerial lava flows were erupted between 42 and 34 million years. We call it the Tillamook episode after the Tillamook volcanics right here. But they occur throughout the central part of the Oregon Coast Range and represent renewed oceanic basaltic volcanism, but this time on the continental margin. Zooming in on the geologic map, Forget all of the details here, but all this orangey stuff is the Tillamook. And it's a shield volcano that's built on top of folded Sletz River volcanics, which is only exposed down in the canyons. And so the folding occurred before these volcanics were erupted. And these volcanics were erupted from regional dike swarms. And I talked about that rotation. If you unrotate the dike swarms, they're oriented like this. And the whole margin is stretching north-south. Something really important happened here after Silesia accreted and caused this renewed volcanism. So we can take this story of the accretion of Silesia at 5649. This is a cross section. This is British Columbia. California is down there. This is Oregon and Washington. And this is the time scale of uh, normal inverse polarity. Uh, that occurred over the last between 65 and 30 million. Uh, between the time of Silesia's uh, 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 creation, 5649, subsequent collision shown by these unconformities in here with the wavy lines at 50 million years, and then 42 million year old rifting shown by these dikes and these younger volcanic piles at 42. We can connect all of that to a global time scale that we can use to make a movie about how this works. First, I want to go through how we did it. The plate models are reconstructed from magnetic anomalies on the ocean floor that are dated. So this shows the opening of the Atlantic Ocean like this, right? So the Atlantic Ocean is opening up. When the Atlantic Ocean opens up, North America moves west, right? Uh, and if we can... Uh, look at the motion of North America while holding Yellowstone fixed, and we'll see um, uh, a series of vignettes here, and then we'll show the movie. Here's 55 million years ago. What's happening along the West Coast? If North America is moving west and the oceanic plates are moving east, they're subducting along the plate margin right here. And the three plates we have offshore, we have the Kula Plate, the Pacific Plate, and the Farallon Plate, and they are all being created at this white spreading ridge right here. This is called a triple junction, ridge, 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 triple junction. And the youngest oceanic material is uh, at zero million years is created right along that ridge. 
And these three dots show the possible locations of a Yellowstone hotspot at that time. Vic mentioned that there's some uh, concern about just how much it moves over time, but we're using a fixed hotspot just to keep it simple. And so this hotspot sits on this ridge and produces a volume of basalt on the Kula plate that's moving that way and a volume of basalt on the Farallon plate that's moving uh, to the northeast. So we're producing two piles of basalt on two separate plates. And it's kind of like the Galapagos Islands today. Here are the Galapagos Islands. Here's South America. Here's Central America. And here are two big basalt piles which are created on two plates on either side of that spreading ridge. So it looks very much like this. And that's what we think uh, it probably looked like 55 million years ago when Silesia was being created. At 50 million years ago from our geology, it crashed into the margin and was overlapped by these sedimentary deposits. And that's how we know the timing of its docking. And then at 42 million years, Silesia is now part of North America. And so it got pushed westward as North America moved west, uh, like a cowcatcher on a train, right? And it ran over the hotspot. And so that volcanism that occurred after accretion, we think is related to Silesia being pushed over the hotspot uh, at 42 million years. And, um, after 42 million years, we have a gap. It's hard to see exactly where the hotspot might be. And we think that gap is a result of the fact that the Farallon plate subducting has covered it up. And it's underneath that plate going down. Eventually, we think it may have burned through the plate and produced a hole. And, um, and we'll talk about that uh, in a minute. Uh, so at zero million years, here we are with the hotspot here at Yellowstone and uh, potential hotspot tracks coming across the Pacific Northwest with the flood basalts and Silesia terrain and the Tillamook volcanics right in the middle of it. So what I want to show you here is a movie. And each of those tracks uh, going north are the hotspot tracks. The Yakutat and Slets terrain change color when they become part of North America. Now they're part of North America and are pushed right over the top of the hotspot again. And boom, Tillamook is erupted and Yakutat heads for Alaska looking for gold. Anyway, as, as, the, uh, as the hotspot continues, uh, there's a gap in time and then there's uh, a kind of unusual volcanic rock that's erupted as a result of melting slab uh, called Adakites, which Vic will talk about later. Boom, the 17 million years we're producing the Columbia River basalt, and now we're producing the hotspot track along the hotspot. Uh, it's just shown just south of the track. The blue dots represent the way this movie was made in an earlier version of the hotspot. It takes months and months to make the movie. So um, I didn't have time to remake it. But um, but I'll run it through one more time. Two hotspot tracks, one on the Kula, one on the Farallon Plate, both collide with North America and fill the Columbia Abatement with accreted basalt. Now they move with North America westward over the hotspot as the Atlantic Ocean opens. Boom, Tillamook is erupted in the, in the uh, coast ranges. Yakutat heads north. And then we have the sort of the development over time of uh, a, a strip of unusual volcanic rocks that uh, Vic will talk about. And then the uh, subsequent eruption of the Columbia River basalt at 17 million years, right there. And some of the big caldera complexes that start to develop uh, as the uh, North America moves westward over the hotspot over time to produce uh, uh, the Yellowstone complex right there. And with that, I'll switch back to Vic, and Vic can take it from here.
Thanks, Ray. Okay, so I'm going to bring the hot spot home. Uh, you know, that's a great movie. And uh, what you're looking at here, uh, you're looking at a map view, but you're also looking at uh, a, a cross-section view on, on, on the left-hand side. Um, the, the map view on the right-hand side isn't um, uh, related to one particular age, but it's related to these volcanic provinces that we believe that are associated with hotspot activity. Uh, but it also includes uh, uh, Silesia here, which, is, which has been re-rotated back to its original position about uh, 40 million years ago. Um, what you see in gray, this dotted line right here, represents the hotspot track that, uh, that Ray used in, in, in the movie. Again, there, there's a lot of issues with these hotspot tracks because it's a complicated thing to, to try to calculate. Uh, but a more recent hotspot track is shown here by the dark, dark dotted lines right here. They correspond a little bit nicer to, um, uh, to the volcanic provinces that we believe are hotspot related. And this is subdivided into 10 million year intervals, as you see here, going, going back through time. Now, we look at this in terms of a cross section of what's actually happening beneath the surface of the Earth at 40 million years. Well, by 40 million years, uh, Silesia has already been accreted to North America. And the hotspot is located here. You know, it's moved with the Farallon plate right down here. And uh, the slab is, is melting a little bit, and it's producing the Tillamook volcanics that uh, occur right on top, you know, the last thing to erupt uh, on, on, on Silesia. So that's where it is at 40 million. So what I want to do is just go through this uh, through time. If we go to 35 to, uh, uh, to 30 million, uh, the hotspot is here. It still is uh, shielded by, by the Farallon plate. And if you look at what's happening on the surface at this time, well, there's nothing. You know, there's nothing that you can see here that represents uh, uh, the hotspot activity on the surface of the Earth. Uh, but what we do believe is that the plume head at right here, we'll call it a secondary plume head because it's not the kind of plume head that would produce a, a flood basalt promise, at least not yet. Uh, but it's growing, and the reason it's growing is because of flux from uh, the tail. You know, it's always pushing material in here. Uh, so the plume head is getting larger, and its buoyancy, you know, it's hot, so it has low buoyancy, uh, is probably enough to start to uplift uh, uh, the Farallon slab right through here. But no volcanism on, on the surface of the Earth all the way up to 30 million years ago. But then between 30 million years and 20 million years ago, we had a, a pretty significant change that take pla took place uh, behind the Cascade uh, volcanic arc. So here the plume head has got, gotten larger. It's uplifted the slab a little bit more. And it's also started to thermally erode the underbelly of, uh, of the Farallon slab. The result of heating up the slab is that some of the hydrous minerals that exist in the oceanic crust, that's upper layer, of the Farallon plate, if you will, uh, releases water into the overlying mantle, and that in turn induces melting. So we produce magma over a really broad area here, a particular type of magma, high potassium magma that occurs in the back arc area. Uh, but at the same time, we have localized magma, which you see erupting right here, uh, to produce what we call adakite. Now, you know, Ray had mentioned this is a fairly unusual rock type, and, and it is. Uh, it's the kind of rock that we believe is produced by the melting of oceanic crust. Uh, so what has happened here is the heat is enough right above the tail where it's the hardest portion of the plume where it's actually starting to melt that thin layer of oceanic crust and therefore erupting adakite on the surface. And you notice from 30 to 20 MA we have a, a, a trend that parallels uh, the trend of the hot spot, you know, right through here, the hot, the hot spot track. And then we come up a little bit closer in time well, let me just go back here before I do that. Over here, you'll see a legend on, on, on the right-hand side. And this is going up from 30 million years to the present time. And you can see these are color-coded for the rocks that are, that are produced. You know, it's high potassium magnetism is here, and adakite is being produced at, at the same time. But between 20 million years and 17 million years, uh, there's no activity. You know, it's a hiatus in, in volcanic activity, as you will. But right after that, we have a major change that took place where this, the diagonal line that you see here represents the eruption of the Columbia River flood basalts, you know, the initiation and the, and, the, and the large volume erupts. And that erupts about the same time as we have the initial rhyolites that begin to erupt that you see in yellow uh, along the Yellowstone hotspot track. So that's occurring at 17 million years. 
And we can see this pretty easily in the geology. You know, in Oregon, we have some pretty good outcrops. We don't have all the vegetation that uh, Ray had in Silesia, which is good, uh, at least for geology. And here you can see layer upon layer upon layer of all these volcanic rocks that are produced, high potassium volcanism, but also with some adakite uh, in, in, in that mix. And then you have a break in slope right here, and that break, break in slope represents that, that time gap between 20 and 17 million years. And then, bam, we have this massive beginning of the eruption of flood basalts uh, r right through here. So uh, if we come up in time then, uh, what you see in this, this diagonal pattern that I mentioned is right through here, uh, this kind of odd uh, shape, if you will. But what this represents is the area that's covered by all of the vents that actually produce the flood basalts. Uh, they erupted over fissure systems, large fractures in, in the ground, and then lavas themselves started to flow off to the west, as you see here, to form the uh, Columbia River flood basalts, at least, you know, the area that's covered by the Columbia River flood basalts. And at the same time, uh, we had uh, rhyolites of the same age, massive eruptions here of large rhyolites that exist on the hotspot track, whereas the flood basalts largely exist to the north of, uh, of, of the hotspot track itself. So what's going on here? Well, what you're seeing in cross-section is we believe that finally, for the first time, uh, the plume breached uh, the Farallon slab, you know, right, right, right through here. All the volcanism before that, remember, was shielded the slab. If the volcanism wasn't melting of the plume, it was melting the material above uh, uh, the plume itself. But here the plume actually rises and uh, induces melting. Now, there is a little bit of a problem that we have with the, with the hot spot uh, or the plate motion trend uh, and the ages of the volcanic provinces, because what you see here is the 17 million year old volcanic provinces are over here lying on the western side of the uh, Cretonic boundary, you know, right beneath that very thin portion of the North American plate. But the actual location, according, according to the, uh, the latest trend that we have here on plate motion, the hot spot at 17 million years should be here on the eastern side of the, of the Cretonic boundary. And there is geologic evidence to suggest that in fact this is true. And if it is true, what we believe is happening is the plume breaks through right here uh, and it rises up beneath the thicker portion of the plate. But because this plume is so buoyant, it drains upward, kind of like an, upward, uh, an upside down drainage system. You know, it's forced to flow upward across the Cretonic boundary right here into thinner portion of the plate where it melts. You know, you lower the pressure on hot material, it will melt. And that then produces the eruptions that we see along this uh, large trend here uh, to produce the uh, uh, Columbia River uh, uh, flood basalt eruption. So as I said, the, the flood basalts are not produced from central volcanoes. We usually think of volcanism with a big volcano, right? Well, that's not the case in flood basalts. They're erupted from large linear cracks or fractures or fissures, if, if you will. And we have smaller versions of this that we can see in basalt terrains uh, today. You go to Iceland, for example, or other places, you can see these large cracks in the ground uh, where, that are erupting material. You know, fissure eruptions is what we refer to that. Well, we have the same things that are shown here in blue, which represents the remnants that are left over from such eruptions, and these are called dikes. Dikes are produced at depth by the lava that then cools and crystallizes to harden into a rock. And that's what you're looking at here. So every one of these lines represents a place where basalt erupted onto the surface. Uh, we have the largest of the dike swarms, which is called the Chief Joseph Dike Swarm. And this is where 95% of the flood basalt was erupted, you know, in uh, northeastern Oregon and southeastern Washington. But then also the Monument Dike Swarm here that goes through the area of John Day and Pitcher Gorge, for Pitcher people who might be familiar with that. And Steens Mountain, right here, uh, where, where we have those old rocks that, that exist. The hotspot would have existed uh, r r right through here, then spread out across the Cretonic boundary, as, I as I mentioned. Uh, dikes. This is what dikes actually look like today. You know, if uh, you know, if you go into canyons that erode down through the, the stratigraphy of the basalts, you can actually expose the dikes. Uh, so these are a couple of them that suggest uh, that exist in northeast Oregon in the south in the uh, Chief Joseph Dike Swarm. In terms of the Columbia River basalts, you know, lucky for us, uh, the flood basalt problems occurs in an area today where we have the great canyon lands that exist in northeastern Oregon, adjacent Washington and Idaho. 
Uh, these are uh, three different images from the Snake River, the Amnaha River, and the Grand Ronde River for people that might know these areas. And you're seeing well over a kilometer of, of basalt, you know, lava flow upon lava flow, sort of a pancake stratigraphy all the way up. And when you think about this massive amount of lava, that also covers a large area, you know, so it's a, a pretty significant volume, you know, over 200,000 uh, cubic kilometers of, of material. And it erupted over a very short period of time. You know, the main eruption occurred over less than a, about a, a million years. So, you know, to think about that over a short period of time is, is pretty amazing. It really makes you realize how large these eruptions were. So we go up in time as the hotspot track continues to move up uh, uh, toward Yellowstone. Uh, we start to erupt rhyolites over here uh, between 14 and 10 million years, uh, produce areas, you know, different calderas. We have the Waihee Humboldt uh, uh, rhyolite field, uh, Bruno Jarbage field, the Twin Falls field that you see here. It's a fairly broad, large area here. Uh, we don't break it down into different ages because even though there's a generally younging of ages to the northeast, there's also a lot of overlap uh, of ages in, in, in here. So that means the plume tail isn't quite well established enough to produce uh, a hotspot track that is exactly equivalent to the plate motion trend. Uh, but what we see, if you look at the, the photo of here, you see huge pyroclastic flows. I mean, these are uh, a typical of the super eruptions that we've had at Yellowstone. In fact, almost all the rye lights that we have along the track are similar to the large super eruptions that we have uh, more recently. Coming up in time, uh, we then have a series of, of three complexes of, of rye lights. Uh, the first one, getting a little bit younger in time, is 10 to 8 million years, the peekaboo uh, rye light complex that you can see right, right here. Uh, we move up a little bit closer to Yellowstone. We have the Heist Volcanic Field. You know, all of these represent different calderas that have been mapped out uh, specifically. I should add also that, you know, the work I'm talking about is, involves numerous geologists all over numerous institutions. There's a large amount of work that's been doing, done on all of this uh, material that I'm presenting today. Uh, this is from 7 to 14.8. And then we come a little bit closer in time to where we are today at Yellowstone. And you can see the calderas associated with the three super eruptions. Uh, the last one, 630 million years ago, you can see in the, in the reddish uh, uh, outline uh, that we see here. So that's where we are. I mean, where we exist today is in a, con in a continuum. You know, what you've seen in the past is going to probably continue as into the future. Um, so just to, to summarize this very, very quickly, uh, you know, what we believed is that, you know, a few things we, uh, Ray and I, uh, kind of put this together, uh, you know, we had a longer summary, we're kind of shortening it here a, a, a little bit, but the first thing to think about is that we have a long and very long-lived deep mantle plume that's very similar to Yellowstone, or, or similar to Hawaii. Um, Ray presented some evidence where you can see these long lives events in other hot spots, so it, it, it fits that model very uh, well. Number two, as you see over here on the left, um, is that volcanism produced basalts on the Oregon uh, and wh what we see in Oregon and Oregon in uh, Washington today is the Siletsu terrain, and maybe even in Alaska as the Yucatan terrain, uh, that was later dispersed uh, by te tectonic motion. And you know, the, of course, the uh, uh, counterclockwise uh, or clockwise rotation. Uh, and number three, uh, it produced the continental hotspot track that you can see today. Uh, uh, and we can trace that back to at least 17 million years ago, at least the, the continental hotspot. Before that, you know, before 17, we have a, sh a shielded hot spot, and before that, we had an oceanic hot spot that existed. Uh, but the main event during this time is the first dramatic pulse of breakthrough that produced the Columbia River basalts. Uh, so that's our story. We're sticking to it. <laughs> and uh, thanks for coming. And if you have any questions, Ray and I will be happy to ask if or answer them if we can.